All right. Well, I will get straight into it then. Uh, my name is Leah Barclay. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project called Biosphere Soundscapes. And I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much to everyone working behind the scenes on putting on this incredible event. And it's so great to have an event that is really encouraging uh, online and virtual engagement with a physical event, which has, of course, become uh, you know, the common way that we're seeing events running at the moment, but such a wonderful opportunity for uh, the WFAE to connect our global acoustic ecology community. So I'm going to screen share and dive straight into it. So I'm talking to you today about a project called Biosphere Soundscapes, and this has been running for over 10 years now. And so this paper is more of a reflection on the work that we have done in the past and where we're heading in the future. And I do want to start by acknowledging that I'm talking to you today from the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia on Gubby Gubby Country. And I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also really acknowledge the First Nations and Indigenous collaborators on this project. This is an image from the Maroochydore River, which is just up the road from where I am now in the middle of the Sunshine Coast Biosphere Reserve. And it's quite close to the location where the Biosphere Soundscapes project first started. And this is one of my main collaborators on the project, Lyndon Davis, who is a Gubby Gubby artist. And Lyndon has worked with me over the last decade on various research projects, but has been a really important collaborator around building and designing the different aspects of Biosphere Soundscapes project and responding to listening and really teaching me to listen from different perspectives. So I really wanted to acknowledge uh, Lyndon as a collaborator at the start of this presentation. So Biosphere Soundscapes re was really started from this idea of uh, my passion for acoustic ecology and my passion for listening, I wanted to find ways to connect the communities of biosphere reserves around the idea of listening and really look at how we could explore listening as a tool for environmental health in biosphere reserves, but also ways that listening could be a method to connect communities in the changing ecosystems of UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. So the project has taken various forms over the last decade, but it's had this specific focus on field recording and field recording from different perspectives, really looking at this notion of, you know, if we're listening to the health of our bodies to measure um change then how can we listen to the health of our environments and ecosystems to measure change that was one of the foundation uh, well founding ideas i guess of the project and this other notion that there's so many aspects of our changing ecosystems that we don't traditionally have access to so a huge focus on biosphere soundscapes has been listening in ultrasonic and infrasonic ranges and listening below the surface of freshwater and marine environments using hydrophones, of course. Um, and that has been, you know, a really core focus of the last decade in really looking at different modes of providing um, community engagement and education around using technologies like hydrophones in biosphere reserves. And it's also been about making um, field recording and as accessible and affordable and inclusive as possible for the communities of biosphere reserves. So looking at ways that we can install and build different forms of uh, acoustic recorders. This one built by Frontier Labs in Brisbane, not far from where I am now, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the small audio moth recorders, which have been kind of game changing for the idea of acoustic monitoring uh, in remote and regional communities in parts of the world. This has really made the field a lot more accessible and inclusive given that these devices are so cheap and so easy to use it means that these can be packaged up and sent literally anywhere in the world and put in the hands of communities to be used in the ways that they see best and some of you may have seen the team behind audio moth has also introduced the hydromoth which is now the smallest um, 
fully compact underwater uh, recorder uh, with a hydrophone as well, of course. Well, it's a, a waterproof hydromoth, really. Um, so that was really the foundation ideas of Biosphere Soundscapes, this large scale interdisciplinary project that's underpinned by the creative possibilities of acoustic ecology. And the project had quite a specific design right at the beginning, this idea of um, facilitating residencies in biosphere reserves throughout the world. And that's been something that has uh, been ongoing over the last 10 years, taken different shapes in different communities. But these are essentially all of the different aspects of the project in those first five years in particular. So focusing on creative outcomes, masterclasses, internships, biodiversity monitoring, We've had various formats of global sound maps over the years, and then this focus on working directly with UNESCO on looking at methods of how acoustic ecology can actually be a tool for measuring health in biosphere reserves. And that's from uh, a social, ecological and cultural perspective as well. So it's been really exciting to go from basically, you know, banging on UNESCO's door constantly for about three years to now have the opportunity to work really closely with them on looking at different methods of um, understanding the role of changing soundscapes in UNESCO biosphere reserves. So that residency model has been really at the heart of Biosphere Soundscapes. This is one of our very first residencies in the Noosa Biosphere Reserve with uh, Ross Bent and Daniel Blinkhorn. Um, Eric did a, a, an introduction to us online at this event, uh, representing the WFAE, of course. And this was kind of the starting point of how we framed those interdisciplinary residencies. We've also run residencies in places like India and Mexico. This was the 2015 residency in Siankam Biosphere Reserve in Mexico, where we worked with a diversity of ecosystems and communities across that region. And as a practicing artist myself, we've also always had this really strong focus on creative outcomes and working with communities to produce immersive installations and performances based on the soundscapes of the biosphere reserves that sometimes included you know building site specific venues like this geodesic dome uh, on Malula Bar Beach in the middle of the Sunshine Coast Biosphere Reserve or these augmented reality sound walks which have had a focus on bringing the soundscapes of biosphere reserves to urban environments. An example of this is all of the recordings that I did in the central Amazon biosphere reserve were mapped to Times Square in New York uh, for Climate Week in 2015 and subsequently then taken to COP21 in Paris and actually mapped to each floor of the Eiffel Tower, tracking those four distinctive layers of the soundscapes of tropical rainforest vegetation. So that's an example of some of those creative outcomes. And those initial stages of the project, and you know, those of you that may have heard me talk about Biosphere Soundscapes before, I often talked about this idea of mapping the changing soundscapes of 10 UNESCO biosphere, uh, sorry, 100 UNESCO biosphere reserves in the first 10 years of the project. And that was one of the main missions that I sort of set out to do. And in many ways, we've done that in various forms or another. Uh, in some contexts, that might just be single recordings from a biosphere reserve. But I quickly realized that that overarching intention you know, wasn't really what was at the heart of this project. There, there was become quite a different focus in the last few years. And that focus has been sort of shifting from working in all of these global biosphere reserves to bringing the focus right back here where the project started. So the project launched in the Noosa Biosphere Reserve. And at that point in time, there wasn't actually biosphere reserves on either side of it uh, just last year we received the recognition for the Sunshine Coast Biosphere Reserve. So now this region right here in Queensland, Australia is the only region in the world that has these three biosphere reserves with diverse ecosystems side by side. And they all have a really strong First Nations, Indigenous leadership and are all really um, engaged and committed to working on this biosphere soundscapes project. So the focus has really shifted right back to where the project began and looking at how we can create 
um, a meaningful difference in this community, but also how this community can really be a lab for some of the ideas that we're exploring through the project, which really it has been that laboratory for experimentation throughout the whole project. So this is that biosphere corridor. We now have three biosphere reserves sitting side by side. And the project really evolved about uh, five years ago now to have this focus on live streaming from Biosphere Reserve. So we're about to launch a series of live streams in those three Biosphere Reserves leading into Reveille, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this presentation as well. So this idea of live streaming the soundscapes of Biosphere Reserves is done in collaboration with many organizations that you can see listed there. And this has really been about that real time engagement. And naturally, with the impacts of COVID uh, from the beginnings of 2020, we really shifted gears with ensuring that the project could uh, still be accessible for the communities that were engaged, but also looking at new methods for virtual collaboration. So really focusing on that live streaming project, looking at the possibilities of virtual collaborations and remote monitoring, and focusing on the ongoing development of this global community platform. Now, the next five years of the project have quite a specific focus on different aspects that have been uh, embedded in the project throughout, but perhaps not really pushed to the forefront. And one of the things that I'm most passionate about at the moment is shifting from this model of the kind of different biosphere soundscapes frameworks that we've been working with to developing this really responsive uh, research with biosphere reserves. So this idea of focusing around regenerative design principles, really looking at ethical research around listening and listening to biosphere reserves based on what the communities of the biosphere reserves really want to do and helping them access funding to do that, helping them access partnerships to do that. And one of the most critical things has been to ensure that we're really prioritizing indigenous led and community led research projects. So whereas Biosphere Soundscapes in some of these is taking more of a backseat and becoming a mechanism to help communities really build up these research projects around acoustic ecology. And this idea of locally focused, globally connected has always been at the heart of Biosphere Soundscapes, but I don't think uh, I've always necessarily uh, abided by that in the sense that I, you know, pre-COVID spent a lot of time uh, traveling co constantly around the world, working with different biosphere reserves. And in many ways, that was a contradiction in the way that the project was set up. So I'm staying very focused at this point on this community with these three biosphere reserves and continuing to facilitate and support all of the international work that we're now handing over the reins to ensure that can be community led and uh, indigenous led on the ground. The Biome Streaming Project is a huge focus in partnership with many of our collaborators and really focusing on looking at regenerative technologies for field recording at the moment and the design of those technologies as well. Reciprocity is really at the heart of the project. I've never since the very beginnings wanted to, you know, work with a community where we weren't invited, but also work with a community where we couldn't ensure that it was mutually beneficial, where we weren't either leaving field recording technologies for the community to continue to continue to work with or looking at different methods that the project was really going to benefit that community long term. So reciprocity has really always been at the heart of Biosphere Soundscapes, but I've started to talk about it really explicitly as the core focus now as well. Now, in terms of the local research in our three biosphere reserves here, we've really shifted from this idea of monitoring and engagement, this idea of monitoring changing soundscapes to the idea of sound as, a, as an act of regeneration and restoration tool, looking at the opportunities for playback in you know brief environments i've been working with uh, monica gagliano on looking at 
this idea of acoustic regeneration in uh, the growth of plants, which is really exciting. And likewise, we have an ongoing project looking at the acoustic ecology of seaweed and looking at regeneration specifically in that context as well. And framing a lot of those projects around significant upcoming um, partnerships and events. So partnerships and collaborations is really the heart of biosphere soundscapes moving forward we've always had a lot of artists and scientists working with the initiative but working in collaboration with different organizations and universities has been such a rich opportunity to expand this project and working in collaboration with different people so there's uh, way too many people involved to even mention everyone's name in this presentation but i did want to acknowledge um, people like Monica Gagliano that have been such a key inspiration in looking at different ways and different approaches to listening in the project. And of course, working in the design and development of technologies, organisations like SoundCamp have been really critical and really looking at making this technology as accessible and inclusive as possible. As an example of this, Biosphere Soundscapes is collaborating on Reve 2023 again, coming up in uh, just a few weeks in May, and we'll be live streaming the soundscapes of the three local biosphere reserves, but I'll also be mixing the Asia Pacific region as a overall contribution to the project. Another example of those collaborations is education. So this workshop has literally just been announced today by CAMP uh, in France, and you'll see some very familiar names on the list there. This will be a really exciting workshop that's bringing together so many different ideas around listening, transmitting and curating soundscapes. And for me, the opportunities to collaborate on these education programs and workshops and continue to share knowledge and connect these ideas is absolutely critical for biosphere soundscapes and the heart of this project you know is really sharing these different perspectives on listening and encouraging practices of listening so for me engaging young people is such a important part of everything we do through biosphere soundscapes and one of the key aspects that we're moving into now is really looking at measuring the health benefits of acoustic ecology and listening as a tool for well-being so looking at bringing the soundscapes of biosphere reserves into hospitals which we've been doing on and off as experiments over the years but really focusing on that research now looking at the benefits of the soundscapes of biosphere reserves in aged care facilities and also looking at the benefits of acoustic ecology in um, areas of confinement, such as prisons. This is part of a sister project called Listening to Country, which has been bringing uh, the soundscapes of uh, country into prisons and then for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women to compose with those soundscapes and record the sounds of their own bodies and mix those into the soundscapes as well as a tool for well-being in prisons. So that engagement with young people has you know it's always been at the core of what we're doing and what we will continue to do and i've always been really committed to the idea if we can inspire the next generation to engage in these practices of listening and acoustic ecology then you know we really do have a lot of hope for the future i think i would be at time now so i'm gonna stop there thank you very much Thank you so much. Um, and we'll go ahead and take questions from the room if that's all right. And if you're awesome. at home at, at Zoom, please feel free to type that in and I'll try to read that out loud too. So, and if you have a question, come up here. We have the webcam. Hi, Leah. I'm Chaba Hainuzi from Budapest. And my question is, how can a national park, let's say from Hungary, join the program? Yeah, thank you. There's, I mean, there's plenty of ways. Do you mean how to become a biosphere reserve or how to take part in biosphere soundscapes? 
Uh, I'll I'll answer it both ways if you like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's. I mean, we're we're also helping and kind of mentoring regions to become biosphere reserves as well. So we've got kind of package kits around the idea of looking at how a national park can become a biosphere reserve and what value okay. that might have. So if you send me an email, I can share some information on that. But as far as biosphere soundscapes go, as I mentioned, we've kind of shifted from this notion of having uh, you know, quite a responsive framework with various aspects of the project to really looking at collaborations and facilitating ideas in um, in kind of any sort of format. So I guess if there's a national park that's interested in participating in the project in some way or another, you know, we're really open to um, collaborations and ideas and whatever the interest is on the ground to see what we can do to support that. Okay, thanks. No problem. Any more questions or have we run out of time? No. no? Hi, Liam. My name is Perry Howard. I'm based in Washington State, in the United States. I just had a quick question um, about um, the soundscape recording techniques that you're using. Are you doing mostly like drop kit recordings without the human presence there? Or are you sort of roaming with the gear? I saw some pictures of that. Um, or is it kind of a healthy mix of both? And is there a, a paradigm around that? Or do you just respond, you know, as you're able to, uh, to the environment? And thank you so much for your wonderful work. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, that's a great question. I, I would say healthy mix of both. In the context of the residencies, we have, you know, really big conversations about that as well, because the residencies are often drawing in artists and scientists. And I find with a lot of the science students I'm working with from a more bioacoustics and ecoacoustics perspective, you know, they are um, making all of their decisions in the field without listening. So they're, you know, perhaps, and this is a huge generalization, but they're perhaps getting one of those audio moth recorders, deciding where they're going to record, deciding where they're going to put um, the recorder, and then even taking all of the data back to their lab and processing it all using acoustic indices without listening at any stage of the process. So the core focus of Biosphere Soundscapes is to really encourage those practices of listening to make decisions at every point throughout that process, whether that be a recording purely for scientific purposes or a recording for a creative project. So in terms of that balance between recording in situ and recording remotely, we'll often do um, in situ recordings at a location and, and then the following day leave recorders there for four or five hours and then listen to you know both recordings in the context of the workshops and residencies and really reflect on you know what it means to listen in situ and then hear how that environment you know changes without human presence as well so it's not a a kind of I guess a method where we um, suggest one way of recording is is better than the other, but certainly really position all of the different reasons why um, those different recording approaches can be beneficial for different purposes. That's a great response. Thanks so much. Pleasure.